Hello, this is Chris from Open Mind Space. It is August 12th, 2014. And in tonight's episode, which will be on the Voluntary Virtues Network, I'd like to talk about how many of the ills of society, such as statism, war, and other kinds of uh, conflict and imposition are caused by not living in the present. I think this is a concern that cuts through many different problems. It's not the, uh, you know, fixing this issue is not, not a silver bullet, but I do believe that it can lead to many of a uh, the kinds of solutions that we need in order to really address the ills of society. So one thing I think that many of us are often unaware of is just how much we live in the abstract. How much we kind of act as if the past defines the future and that we have no real control over it in the present. I think that attitude is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This belief that the past, you know, things that happened hundreds of years ago somehow define the present for us and that it's virtually unchangeable that it's created a kind of inertia that is unstoppable that our ancestors you know especially in the last few hundred years that they created a a system and a set of uh, traditions that were of course based on what their ancestors had, had created and that we have no choice but to perpetuate, to continue to perpetuate those systems and to just incrementally change them. So as long as we don't live in the present, that's kind of about all we're really able to do in regards to those sorts of things. And unfortunately, I think many of us will continue not to live in the present. And, you know, as such, it's uh, kind of an individual decision, you know, that each of us has to make. You know, we can't help what other people are going to do. You know, if you study some of the meditation techniques of uh, Buddhism, for example, you find that you kind of have to come to terms with the fact that others, you know, other forces outside of yourself are going to have their own, they're going to go their own way, they're going to do their own thing despite what we as individuals may prefer that they do. We may like to see something else happen, you know, something happen differently. But what ends up happening is we end up kind of living in some, kind of like living in limbo to where we just hope that one day things get sorted out so that we can really start living, you know, so that we can really start enjoying life when all the issues get sorted out, when the state is gone, when war is a thing of the past. But really, you know, if you want to be free, you need to start living now. 
start enjoying the freedom that you have now. Otherwise, really, are you any better than the statist who blindly regurgitates tradition? Because in a way, this is a tradition. Uh, getting caught up in ideals and longing for other people to change and other things to change. All the while not improving yourself, not working on yourself. You know, I don't know how many uh, libertarians or anarchists I've known, and I've been, you know, in in this predicament uh, on many occasions. I think we all kind of go in and out of our level of awareness, but who just are their their life is a mess. They're not living in the present. They're living in, you know, it's like their escape is thinking about this future that they'd like to see, but are doing nothing but philosophize about it. Nothing but to thinking, think about what they think ought to happen sometime down the road, what everyone ought to do differently. And that doesn't tend to be very productive. It seems as if the real productive thing is to change one's self. And when we get caught in these traps where we are dwelling in the past or fantasizing about the future, It really paralyzes us. Take, for example, here's a classic situation that many people refer to when they think of war. I mean, there's wars going on all over the globe. Some are more deadly than others. I mean, there's just people being slaughtered all over the place. It seems as if on some level at least, much of it is done for religious reasons. The example that probably comes to mind in most people's heads is the uh, conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now, I don't think such a conflict could happen without there being a state. Because it's that madness that actually drove, uh, you know, the madness of these people wanting to have their own state. The Israelis, they wanted to have their own little state. And they petitioned a violent bureaucracy to say, okay, this is yours now. This is your state. And they had, you know, armies and whatnot uh, take people off and kick them off their property. Now if there weren't if people didn't have this idea of states and of there being some kind of axe to grind from the past uh, that they were victims for some reason you know that although they're alive and they're doing just fine they've got the money to move over there and buy real estate and all that they're somehow a victim and deserve to be compensated at the expense of the people who are already there. Well, that's kind of living in the past. You know, they live in the past as if they somehow are entitled to something because of something that they perceive that happened to their ancestors, who are really the ones who actually bore the uh, the pain, if there was any pain, you know, depending on what you're referring to. Yet somehow they think that they can come and collect on it and at the expense of these other people, and it creates this tremendous conflict that roars uh, on a regular basis, and and they tend to be the main instigators of it. You know, they're the ones with the very powerful weapons. They're the ones who take any sort of any sort of uh, excuse to go and start attacking, you know, the Palestinians and and so forth. Uh, 
I mean, these people are poor as hell. They're, you know, they've hardly got anything going for them. And then they've got these rich people just showering down hell on them and then blaming them for it. And then if they happen to shoot a, something back, they, they act like, oh my God, why would they ever do that? They have this uncanny ability to live in the past and to project this kind of victimhood as if they somehow might get wiped out by these poor people who have hardly any resources, who have hardly any weapons, who don't have billions and bajillions of dollars, who don't have nuclear weapons, and yet they're able to, in their own minds, use that as a way of justifying a massive slaughter. You know, and it's just amazing the psychology behind it. You know, this is just one example. There's all sorts of different cultures and societies that do nonsense of this sort. You know, in Iraq, there's all these religious, uh, these different factions, these different sects that uh, they really don't work well together in the same society. They'd be better off having their own isolated societies because when they are together and they're mixed and there's this cultural mixing it causes uh, problems and and you know I don't know what to do about it but the plain fact of the matter is you know why would these people do this if they weren't somehow living in the past because these are just old conflicts that they're just repeating they're just photocopying their history as some people would put it they're just they're just blindly regurgitating you know tradition and it just gets perpetuated you know because somebody can't snap out of it and and live in the present and understand the benefit of living in the present and just seeing people as other human beings and mutually exchanging with them and loving them and caring for them looking out for them you know, there's there's no advantage to this. They delude themselves into thinking that because their parents and their, you know, I don't even know how far this Iraqi thing goes back, but, you know, in many cases it goes back a few generations. You know, in the case of the Israel thing, it's, uh, in the grand scheme of history, it's relatively recent. You know, the uh, you know they like to act like it's gone on for thousands of years, but based on the what I've seen, um, it doesn't really go back beyond the whole um, creation of the state of Israel. You know, they were getting along reasonably well prior to that, and uh, you even had you know Jews and Muslims. Uh, living together and I'm sure that if they had just come in there and purchased land and integrated in gradually in that fashion it would have been fine because nobody would be a refugee you don't go and live in a refugee camp in a tent if your house has just been bought if you just voluntarily sold your house you don't go live in a refugee camp somewhere so you know What's the way out of something like that? Well, I, I would say it is to recognize that there are still people living or their children who actually have titles to land that they're not allowed to return to uh, because they were forced off during the creation of the state of Israel and let them have their property back. It's pretty easy to establish that claim because there was already a system of property in place prior to this whole mess. You know, the same could be said for the few Native Americans that are left. If there's any sort of way of establishing any sort of legitimate claim to some property, by all means, reestablish it. You know, don't set the precedent that you can just go and use some old shit from the past and take over a place and then say, oh, well, it's already ours, therefore we can then say that, um, we can then say that you're attacking us by trying to return to your property. You know, it's kind of like, uh, 
that's pretty uh, barbaric. You know, you go and you take something by violence. I mean, that, isn't that what property rights are all about, is trying to keep people from going and taking things through violence? You want to establish these norms so that people can peacefully live with one another and deal with disputes and conflicts. Because I think most people prefer to have peaceful ways of, of resolving conflicts. If you just have, you know, mobs can just get together and say, you know, there's a lot of us and we're politically influential and powerful. And we would like to petition this body that is uh, biased towards us already and have it say that we can legitimately take everything in this vicinity from somebody who already possesses it and owns it and maintains it and that we can basically turn them into you know second class you know peasants and have a second uh, set of laws for them and kind of put fences you know put developments up and put fences around it and treat them uh, horribly and you know of course treat our own people with a completely different set of of rules and you know and our sympathizers and and those who enable us then you do that and you're bound to just have conflict because if you don't you know if you yourself don't know how to act peacefully towards others how is anybody going to know how to act peacefully towards you you've got to start right now acting peacefully and cooperatively towards your neighbor and recognizing their humanity. And how, how could you expect that you'll have all the profit that happens when you when you have cooperation, when you have peace and cooperation that's immensely profitable for everybody? There's uh, very few people who actually profit from conflict and war. And generally, they're the ones who are trying to convince you that it is a good idea to live in the past and to milk some idea about a victimhood or, or some other kind of nonsense. You know, I mean, when you step back and you look at it, I mean, just looking at events that have happened here lately, you see that uh, a few people got murdered and then promptly they go and start bombing the shit out of people who had nothing to do with it. They didn't even bother to really investigate it. They just, the knee-jerk response, they wanted to do this anyways, they were looking for an excuse to do it, and they go and start just bombing people, and then rockets start getting fired back, and they're like, oh my god, how dare you? How dare you shoot a rocket back at us? This is preposterous. Oh my god. Indiscriminate killing. And, um, Meanwhile, you know, they have killed over, what was it, something like 1,500 people? 1,500 some odd people. You know, some of them, quite a few of them are children. And then there's all this rhetoric and propaganda about them using human shields, which is all coming from the, uh, the IDF uh, propaganda sources. Uh, they rarely actually substantiate any of this stuff. They say, you know, they have it all set up very nicely to where, you know, people, you know, as I was saying, people live in the fucking past. These people don't have to actually establish the facts that they're claiming are to be true. They can just say, oh, these people are, you know, subhuman, you know, more or less say they're subhuman. They're using human shields and we're the civilized ones and you know when you see the big massive explosions happening over these places it's because they had something hidden underneath something and that's for it's okay uh, didn't matter who died as a result of it um, there could be massive massive casualties and they can hit power stations they can hit whatever because the three people that were killed or that I means the handful of people that were killed uh, are worth more than the thousands that they're killing over there. And, you know, I think this this shows a very a sickness in 
our society. And this in particular is very, you know, this is not, this is definitely not by far the biggest bloodbath that's happening or that has happened in recent times. It's just the most uh, visual, I would say. It's the most widely um, covered, I think, at least here lately. Because uh, this is an important place for people. There's um, a lot of people who live in the past are obsessed with with this. I mean, we're talking people who live hundreds and hundreds of years in the past, or if not thousands of years in the past. They live so far in the past that they think that these people are some superior race, uh, like the Israelis are some kind of superior race. And so they have a special status, and they have a you know, you, there's a lot of different levels of living in the past that you can use for the Israelis. Uh, much of it is World War II, but of course, the people who believe in, you know, the Abraham, the Abrahamic religions, you know, the Christianity and Judaism and whatnot, they have just a special place in their heart for, for these people, and it doesn't matter what they do. I mean, you could transpose that onto anybody else. The things that have been done basically just shooting massive, massive amounts of explosives at civilians. And there would be no way of justifying it. There would be no way of sanctioning it. They would say those people are murdering, murdering terrorists. But in this case, there's a very large proportion of the population who, for a variety of reasons, is totally stuck in the past. And would it, there's just about nothing that they could do you know it would take quite a lot they might wake up to it after it was all done like they if they went and killed every last you know palestinian or something like that uh they had some kind of massive you know carpet bombing extermination there might be you know a decade or two later there might be some kind of realization that that there was something that went horribly wrong there but as it is right now, uh, just about any excuse is believed. And I'm a little shocked. I mean, I, I've got friends, people who I really respect as people who I think are caught up in this mess. And I hate to see it because I know many of them are brilliant individuals. And it doesn't mean that you're, you know, it doesn't mean that you're stupid or anything if you have a different belief than me. I'm not trying to say that. Well, I have called a few people stupid over it. I'll give you that. But uh, honestly, though, uh, almost everybody I know who doesn't question what's going on there, who just is is blindly on the on the side of the Israelis, is. A religious individual. I've only met a few people who are your classic kind of materialist atheists who who support it, and and you know, they've got their whole their own little set of problems too. But this particular area is dear to primarily to people who are religious, whether they be Muslim or Christian or what have we. And there's a lot of kind of uh, team bullshit that goes on here like that's uh, their team it's like their super bowl team or something like that their football team and it doesn't matter what their team does you know even if it completely goes contrary to their own moral persuasion it's perfectly all right it's uh there's always some this is the thing this is the thing is they're always going to have some kind of an excuse for whatever they do. So, just as a hypothetical, let's say there's a, let's say they just bomb a hospital, which I believe actually happened. But let's say they bomb just a massive hospital. Well, they would say that they were keeping missiles on the basement of the hospital or something like that. 
and that that therefore justifies them bombing the hospital. Because those missiles would have been shot back, and maybe one of them might have hit somebody. And so it justifies the loss of life. And there's a lot of talk about things like, and this is where the hypocrisy really sets in, I think. There's a lot of talk about returning, that, you know, the Bible says that they ought to, they're, that they're, yeah, I'm not a Bible scholar or anything, but I've seen a lot of talk about this right of return, that, that used to be theirs, and that they ought to be able to return. Well, you know, if that's the case, then the Palestinians who owned the uh, property uh, who were kicked off, they have the right to return as well. However, this is not equally applied. And this goes back to this belief that they are superior. And that's, that's more living in the past. I'm not superior to anyone else, and neither are you. In any sort of objective sense, you know, it's my actions that define my superiority. You know, if I'm good at something, then I'm superior to you at that particular thing. But there's no, like, you know, I'm just, because of who I was born to, because of the person who had me as a child and how they indoctrinate me into their particular culture, that that somehow makes me, you know, superior. No. And furthermore, if a person's way of interacting with others is to use conflict and violence to obtain resources, then I would say that in that regard, they're certainly not superior. You know, the superior uh, person in regards to the dealings, you know, dealing with other people and such, they have an honest, uh, they live an honest life and they buy what they, you know, they, they trade, they purchase things from others, they negotiate conflicts peacefully. You know, when, isn't that what uh, most of you would prefer? That's certainly what I prefer. I know we don't all prefer that. Obviously, they don't prefer that because that works out well for them. You know, you have a political authority who they believe in giving them free shit, basically. Giving them, you know, people's houses who were confiscated or giving them uh, land or, you know, just giving them great deals on shit. And they don't have the moral scruples to say, you know, I don't really, um, this isn't really my thing. You know, like, I don't, you know, when you think about it in, in if it were to happen to you, how you would feel about it, you know, this whole golden rule thing that's supposedly so important, you know, oh, the, somebody coming in, busting in my home and saying, oh, this is no longer yours, these people now get it because we've decided that they ought to have it, and as a result, you've got to move out and go live in a tent somewhere in the desert and starve, and probably your children die and all that kind of great fun. You know, if you can't empathize with that as a human being and understand what it would be like in the immediacy of that experience, uh, then you can certainly, you know, take a home that was given to you. But uh, I think there's a lot of people who wouldn't be willing to do that. And I guess it doesn't matter how many people would or wouldn't be willing to do something. But to support something like that, when it's actually happening, to actually go along with it, you've really got to be, you've really got to be stuck in the past. I mean, to go in, you know, like in, I don't know if these stories are true, but supposedly in Iraq, there's, you know, ethnic cleansing sorts of things going on that there's, this, this could be propaganda for all I know. I mean, I know there's a ton of propaganda. I haven't had a chance to sort through it, but, um. Supposedly there's, you know, shit's hitting the fan over there and these people are fucking crazy and they are stuck in the past. And they're going and, you know, trying to pick off their enemies, their religious or political enemies, and uh, beheading people and doing crazy shit like that. You know, what person who's able to actually live in the present is able to do that? 
You know, if you're able to live in the present and understand, you know, how those sorts of behaviors affect the harmony in the present moment and create turmoil and create loss for everyone, you know, every life lost is a loss for everyone because every, you know, even if you're purely a selfish bastard, selfish capitalist bastard, you look at and you see that, um, a life is being lost, that's one less person to create wealth. You know, we all have the potential to create wealth more than we consume. And the more of us there are doing so, being productive, being harmonious, being peaceful, and, you know, understanding the need to work within everybody's preferences to try to create a, a greater harmony, the better our own life will be. Yet these people are, are shitting on their own future, their own lives, their own future, creating an atmosphere of just, it's got to be utter hell because of old fears. The old fear that if we don't wipe them out, they'll wipe us out. Or that so-and-so did something to us, and therefore we've got to do something to them. You know, if they could just bury the hatchet and understand how important it is to the present that they come to a harmonious solution, that they come to a fair agreement where it's not going to perpetuate the conflict then they could easily dig their way out of it. They'd have far more. They'd have far more of what they want in life. Generally speaking, I mean, many people like to go and behead. I mean, I guess there's these psychotics in society who like to go and um, do things like beheading people and, uh, you know, surrounding people and killing them. They just they're so stuck in the past they can't. They can't resist. They've got the opportunity. Uh, what was it? There was a, a story just today of uh, cops um, shot some kid. And uh, what did they do? Uh, they went and uh, rioted in response to it. Destroyed a bunch of shit. Well, there's two levels of being stuck in the past in, in, in this situation. One is the whole idea that this uh, badge and uniform and all that give the cops the uh, ability to go and, I mean, I don't know about the specific details of this, but, you know, it's quite frequent that cops just, uh, because of the virtue of the fact that they have a badge and a gun and they are an employee of the state, can just go and kill people and everybody just like, oh, it's a cop, we can't do anything about it, you know. There's a cop. I, I'm sure the state will investigate itself and determine if, that it was whether it was right or wrong what occurred. And so we have this tradition of just allowing these people to lord over us and be accountable only to themselves. And there's all these beliefs about it, you know, such as democracy and other other, you know, ideas that we just tell ourselves, well, because we voted, it makes all of this okay. Because at least we're represented by somebody. You know, that's that's the ultimate, you know, living in the past. When, because three, four years ago, or could be many more years ago, people voted and they decided to write a law we're all then bound by all those laws. Even if they were laws that were written before we were even born. Yes, many of the laws, I guess, make sense. They're just, I mean, many of them are common sense, I suppose. But I'd say the vast majority of them aren't. The vast majority of them are thrown together for benefiting the friends of the people in power. So you've got all of this baggage that just builds up year on year. You know, 
in modern day society, it's a secular state. It's the the laws, and there's libraries and libraries full of these laws that you're supposed to follow. There's you know like the tax code is gigantic. You've got all these damn codes that you're supposed to follow that were written down by people, many of whom are dead. And they they kind of, in a way, they kind of force people to live in the past out of fear. Because you know that if you violate these laws, the enforcers of the state can come and can get you for, for whatever reason. So you're always, you're always wondering, shit, am I, you know, you're, you're kind of, uh, it's, it's got a chilling effect. You've got this chilling effect where all these laws have been written and you never know if you're, I mean, you may not give a shit if you're violating it, but you know that somebody may care if you're violating it. They may be looking for a leg up in their career to try to get another arrest. You know, uh, there was an example I heard um, just recently. I saw some article floating around that some lady was, uh, I don't remember why she was traveling, but she was traveling between states and she had her kids with her. So it was a mother with children. She was traveling through one of those uh, shitholes up north. I think it was New Jersey or something like that. She was traveling through this shithole, and she got pulled over for whatever stupid reason. And somehow or another, they discovered that she had a gun with bullets in it. Oh my god. A gun with bullets in it. Holy shit. And... I think she's being put through the court system, and uh, I guess they've got mandatory minimum sentences. You know, let's mandatorily lock people in the dungeon for arbitrary reasons and feel okay about it because we're all living in the fucking past. So she's facing over a decade in prison, and there may not be anything that can be done to stop it. You know, maybe they can find some... Maybe they can find some compassion in their heart and come up with some way of dropping the charges or finding a technicality or something. But as it stands, it looks an awful lot like this woman who has children, who's probably a perfectly, you know, average, decent individual, is just going to get thrown in a fucking dungeon and taken away from her children. And what good does that do anyone? That's more blind obedience to ritual and tradition. You know, why did that cop feel okay throwing this woman in the back of her police in the back of their police car or charging her with with an offense that could totally destroy her family? How does that how is that okay? How would you sleep at night knowing that you'd done something like that to somebody who'd not really harmed anyone? It's because this person this police officer is probably hypnotized by this whole nonsensical idea that if you just live in the past, that, that somehow creates a greater good in society. That that following all these stupid laws and enforcing them and following all these rules, that that somehow is order. That that somehow benefits us all. But you can clearly see, as great examples like this pop up, that it doesn't. That there may be examples of where it does, but by and large, it's a complete antithesis to any sort of compassion. You know, I, I think the idea behind these gun laws maybe is well intended. Maybe it's naive, but well intended. Maybe they think that having the laws, I mean, I've talked to people like this before. I've talked to liberals uh, generally, this is a liberal thing, quote unquote. Not that liberal really means uh, well read and educated, uh, but more educated and indoctrinated ignoramus. And I've talked to these people, and they they just they are reactionary to things like gun crime when it happens. They see that somebody comes and shoots up a school or something, and they think, oh, would wouldn't a law about that be you know fix the problem? And, you know, there's yet more living in the past. Oh, some event occurred. Therefore, we ought to impose violence on everybody henceforth. 
in whatever arbitrary way that I prefer. So they um, prefer that um, violence be done against people who own guns. Um, I, you know, I once heard about my own self um, that uh, somebody was, uh, you know, concerned about me having a gun. And it wasn't that they were concerned about my sanity or anything like that. It was that, that I might have an accident with it, that there's all these gun accidents that happen. And I don't un really understand the basis in reality for that. I mean, if people understand gun safety and they take good care to, you know, keep loaded guns away from children who might be able to shoot them, and they don't go pointing it at their head or their toes or at somebody else, then what's really the concern? I mean, the, the concern is overblown. And it's like a lot of this, these kind of fears. It's um, The fear itself is worse than the possible thing that could have happened. You know, the, like the 911, for example, you know, for whatever you might believe occurred during that, which is a show in and of itself, um, an event occurred and a few thousand people died. And the, really the worst thing about it was all the fear that it created. Because all that fear caused all these resources to be misallocated and all these people to be slaughtered in response to it. And it didn't do any, any good and actually made the situation far worse. Because if it is terrorism, then it pissed a lot of people off. And the Israeli-Palestinian thing, for example, there's, it's unfortunate how many people are dying in that. On whatever side is dying, it's unfortunate that people are being slaughtered who are trying to go about their lives and do their business. Because these statists can't fucking keep their fingers off the trigger, can't stop their political agenda from taking place, and these bloodthirsty uh, supporters and apologists for it can't stop their drive to possess all of that land. But I think the deeper misfortune, especially in regards to this conflict, is the fact that it divides so many of us. I mean, there's people that I care about, there's people I've been friends with for my entire life, that if I were to really frankly sit down and discuss this with them, we would probably stop being friends. And they probably know my views and they try not to talk about it with me. But if we were to really sit down and have a frank discussion about it, it would, before anybody would budge, it would probably just end up, somebody would get indignant and it would just end up ending a friendship, a perfectly good friendship otherwise. And there's a lot of people who have this problem. I mean, I've seen people who are supposed anarchists and anarcho-capitalists and whatnot who are, you know, very, tend to be very peace-loving people. I've seen them supporting this, and it's just unbelievable. You know, I, I encountered one guy who's a fairly well-known, uh, kind of an idiot, honestly. But he's well no he's loud and outspoken, and lots of people know about him. And uh, I mentioned a few things, you know, about property rights and whatnot associated with this, and he totally just crapped all over it, and I think I called him an idiot, and he unfriended me, and I wasn't able to interact with him anymore. But, you know, it's, it's a shame to see the way it divides people. You know, it's, I hate that these people are being murdered, but I also hate that people are being divided the way they are. Maybe it's beneficial on some level. Maybe it helps people to kind of see into one another's soul. You know, you can see what people are willing to tolerate. You know, see what your friends and family and and such forth are, um, are okay with. You know, what they're able to excuse. And I guess in that way, it's, you know, it's a lens into people that you wouldn't normally have otherwise. Because most things people don't really care about. But for, for some reason, because of all the religious undertones and the history behind it, and the fact that people are trapped in the past in different ways, they are um, passionate about this. 
And I say, you know, to both sides, just learn to live in the present. You know, come up with a way of dealing with this situation that actually is rational and makes sense. And don't just expect that, you know, and, and most of what I've seen, these people just expect that these Palestinians uh, are just going to let them have all the land and that that's going to somehow be a peaceful solution or that they're going to be able to round them up and put them in camps or something. You know, before you go exterminating an entire society or having war for the next hundred years, how about just think about that for a minute? Think about what kind of a world you really want to be living in. I mean, how many billions of dollars do you want to spend destroying shit, destroying these people, destroying yourself, destroying your dignity? You could have bought <laughs> you could have bought a, uh, you know, luxury apartments for all these people that have been slaughtered with all that money, if you're really, I mean, not that you're going to, but you could have bought, you know, a nice, uh, paid for a very nice society and been the envy of the world and integrated in what is wonderful about their society into your society and lived in peace and harmony. If you really wanted to, you could have bought the land. They could have then, if you didn't want them around there, you could have just bid up the land, buy it. They would be glad to sell it to you at some point. Everybody has their price. You know, somebody wanted this place, come on, give me an offer. You know, at some point you're going to find a, a amount that I'd be willing to part with it for. And then I'll go and find a better place to live. That's compassion. That's living in the present. It's seeing where you are right now, recognizing it, and recognizing it with honesty how to live in harmony with your fellow man. And that's how you avoid all these wars and whatnot. And I realize it's an aggregate phenomenon and it's hard to stop something once it gets started. I mean... In the case of, of this particular conflict that we've been focusing on, you know, this is a, I think, largely a status phenomena. You know, there's many people uh, there, I'm sure, who don't agree with it, who don't support it. And, of course, they don't listen, just like most states don't listen. Uh, and then there's many people who are indoctrinated from birth to support it and to believe that they're, you know, that everybody at these other that everybody and their enemy wants to murder them and destroy them and and um, and so they you know support it without question because they're propagandized and isolated in such a way that uh, it makes it easy to do that. But you know the very least that you can do is to determine what it is to live in the present for yourself to have compassion for your fellow man, to be kind, to create harmony, because ultimately, you know, it's profitable. You know, even if you don't really care about your fellow man, it's far more profitable to be harmonious with them and to create win-win situations and to trade and to um, cooperate than it is constantly, constantly be destroying wealth and having to protect yourself and having to... Uh, dodge bullets and deal with uh, all the problems that come along with people being in conflict with one another. Be better to have competition than conflict. You know, imagine if they had a more peaceful philosophy and they simply were competing to buy up as much land as possible and to outdo one another and to you know, come up with better technology, come up with better social structures. You'd have a much different kind of environment over there than you do right now. You wouldn't have, you know, all these people living in poverty and being randomly slaughtered. 
they'd have a much better, you know, chance. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine what it must be like. I wouldn't want to be on either side of this conflict, but I certainly wouldn't want to be a Palestinian and know that there is, if anything occurs in the world that's distracting enough that they're going to take the opportunity to start shooting, you know, missiles from F-16s over there and blame it, and then blame it all on you. That's got to be terrifying. You know, we, living here in the Americas, it's kind of a, a level of peace and security that is amazing. You know, it's, uh, there's no real enemies. You know, they're, they're trying to obviously create enemies, you know, given the way that they're acting, the, the U.S. government, for example, in the world. But by and large, you know, aside from the tiny, tiny chance of getting hit by some kind of terrorist attack or some kind of false flag or something like that, you're pretty safe. You know, of course, all depending on what city you live in and what part of the city you live in and all that kind of stuff. There's crime, there's regular crime that goes on. But if you carefully choose where you live and you are... Um, good to your neighbors and you take reasonable precautions and you're pretty safe around here. You don't have to worry about some F-16 shooting a rocket and hitting you. Unfortunately, there's many parts of the world where that's not, that kind of harmony is not possible. And it's a shame that, you know, it's, our society, I think, takes for granted its harmony. And you would think that they would appreciate it enough to where they'd want to not be stirring up shit in other people's areas. But then again, I don't think that the state, obviously, is a representative of all of society. I think there's a lot of people who do recognize the importance of peace and harmony and all that kind of stuff. It's just there's segments of the population who either profit off of the the war and the violence, or they are just indoctrinated to think that it's a good thing, that it's preferable. And, you know, as I've been saying, you know, these are the people who live in fear, live in the past. They either live in fear because they don't think that they can make a living any other way, which maybe many of them couldn't in the current paradigm, because they're, you know, completely specialized in that area of making weapons for the government or somehow managing the conflict in some way or another, or maintaining this, the machinations of the conflict. Or they just believe that there's somehow a threat to them, that there's some, some kind of threat to them, and they are okay with maintaining it, even though if you just really step back from it and look at it and look at the facts and figures and the statistics, there's no major threat other than just basic crime, which has actually been going down, to anyone in North America. There's no serious threat that you can't avoid, that most people can't avoid. I mean, I'm sure there's people in situations that are very difficult to emerge from, but if you are living in the present, you can almost always avoid many of these things. And wouldn't it be great if we were compassionate enough to recognize how, how valuable that is to people and how much better it makes our lives, how, how much suffering that prevents. To give people the opportunity to live in the present and to enjoy the kind of novelty that can come out of that. They can come out of not having to worry about watching their backs and worry about fire raining down from the sky and worry about some irrational imbecile who's totally trapped in some kind of statist or religious zeitgeist just raining hell down on you. That's just absurd. 
I don't care who did what to whom. It's not justified. And if we lived more in the present, we would see that. And we'd see all the shit in our lives. All the ways that we're imposing. You know, I think each and every one of us could stand to live more in the present. To see where we could be better to our friends and family and spouse. To see where we're acting without compassion. And improve and be honest with ourselves and to be honest about the things that we're doing well. I see so often that people, rather than facing their problems, rather than facing the people they supposedly care about and talking to them and being frank and honest with them, that they instead just turn their backs. They just avoid it, they walk out, they minimize their interaction. And why is because they're too, too stuck in their ways to just face themselves. You know, they're mainly it's mainly they're running away from themselves. You know, you see all these people, you know, the, the most common disaster I guess that happens, I think, in the United States is people demolishing their own families through divorce. You know, they have these opportunities to create a life for their child for their child with a great chance of success in the future a loving household and the ability to grow up and feel loved and cherished and enjoy the fruits of a stable and healthy family and what do they do they're selfish and they're short-sighted and they just they blow it. They just blow it. They just say, well, I'm bored. Or uh, whatever f bullshit, whatever, f whatever bullshit is, is, uh, is happening, you know, or they, they don't have compassion for their spouse and they become violent with them. And I, there's quite a few people who have this problem that it's just perpetuation of violence and it's often in both parties, you know, both both uh, the spouses. Uh, they just get in these habits of being violent and shitty towards one another and a lot of times it's living in the past as well because that's just what happened in their own childhood. Their parents were violent and that's the way they solved problems and they never bothered to figure it out themselves and get help and deal with those issues within themselves or or maybe they didn't live in a household that was stable and so they don't feel normal in a stable household they call it freedom they say oh i feel more free when i'm not nailed down by having to be a stable person and, which is all fine and good if you don't have children but you know when you've got children you've got to be a stable person you can't be a fuck up and just go and do whatever you want. That costs everybody in your family, including you. It costs everybody. And it's a damn shame when it happens. Because there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of wealth that's destroyed by that. By people just not able to get along with each other. They go and they part ways and they don't cooperate. And then that you've got to start paying for all this extra real estate, you know, paying for rent and real estate and uh, all the buying two of everything and having to replace two of everything. And, you know, it's just a colossal waste of wealth. And then when people get actually divorced and they have to pay the divorce lawyers and all this stuff, that flushes the family's accumulated wealth down the toilet usually. And it goes in the hands of all these useless lawyers whose jobs in many cases are merely to divvy up the assets and often take through their legal fees much of what happened and then impose government rule over the family. 
which much of that is dysfunctional and trapped in the past too. So, I mean, it's a cross-cutting concern. It's a concern that, you know, really causes issue for so many areas. There's so many industries. There, there's all the, you know, the government protectionism, for example. You know, this belief that people have that if the government doesn't use violence to protect X industry, whatever it is, whether it be all the patent things that go on or, or whatever, that that means that they won't be able to to make money and innovate and all this kind of stuff. And there's all sorts of excuses for it. But, you know, it's generally uh, because we're trapped in some kind of nonsensical conception about what will be or could have been, we therefore feel justified in creating this violent system of enforcement to make it so that if I invent something that if somebody else wants to emulate my invention and I've got it patented, that that means I can, you know, call these guys in to go and stick them with lawsuits and and uh, drain their bank accounts and, you know, perpetually, you know, harass them. You know, all because I wrote this thing on, you know, I had lawyers draft all these papers and file them with these people and that somehow means that that's all okay. That that's all just fine and dandy. Oh, I could go on about this for a long time if I had to. I think I'm about out of steam though. Don't want to start repeating myself more than I already have. But yeah, suffice it to say, um, I think that uh, things like uh, Meditation can be really valuable in terms of clearing up your mind and stilling your perception so that you can recognize these kind of things because this is just an individual thing that you've got to figure out for yourself, you know, how to live in the present, something I'm struggling with myself. You know, when I'm not at my best, I start thinking about, oh, this or that that happened to me and it makes me miserable and it makes me have to really sit down and say, you know, do I want to be like this? Do I want to fester in this state of mind or do I want to be live in the present and just solve the problems just deal with it and solve it because I certainly can't expect that of other people if I can't do it myself and I've got to be the example to other people you know if they're if I'm expecting others to live in the present I've got to be the example um, you, you got to show show people how great it can be that's the way to really change things is to show people how great it works out for you. And so if you can learn to be more present, you know, come up with ways of cleansing your, your spirit, so to speak, you know, cleansing your mind and spirit and body and be more present and be more aware, and that would make you more masterful at everything you do, really, because you'll be the one who's aware of what's actually going on. Being aware of what's actually going on is the whole point. If you're aware of what's actually going on, then you are far more able to take advantage of opportunities than somebody who's frozen in ice. There's no advantage to being frozen in ice. The, the only advantage is to people who uh, parasite off of society and live off of that. Those are the ones who benefit from that, not you. You may believe you're benefiting off of it, but it's a very limited benefit, and you would be far better off if you were simply aware as much as you might be afraid of the, of, I don't know, you know, many people are not conscious of this, but I think many people are afraid of reality. They're afraid of being present and aware. And so they hide from it. They run away from it. And that's where the whole victimhood thing comes in. That's where all the, you know, blame so-and-so for the problems and, um, just anything you can do to to say it's all external factors, it's all you know exogenous uh, influences that are that are causing all these problems. I guarantee you that it, part of it's you. Whatever issue is affecting you personally, part of it is you. Either by you choosing to stay in 
that situation not working it out, not coming up with a way of creating harmony, not knowing yourself, not knowing reality, not understanding that um, your happiness can't be created anywhere else but inside of you, that exogenous um, forces will go in whatever way they will go, and that you yourself um, really only have control over your internal reality. And I mean, you may have limited control over the external world, but ultimately there's forces far bigger than you at work here. The aggregate of everybody else's minds, of course, is at work, but there's natural forces, there's natural laws. And uh, if you're, you know, predicating all of your happiness on that going exactly as planned, then you're almost guaranteed to be disappointed. And then when you get disappointed, you're going to be stuck in the past. You're going to be stuck in that disappointment. You're going to be stuck first in the hope that such and such will happen. And then you're going to be stuck in the disappointment that it didn't happen. And then rather than understanding reality and making the right decisions in, in key moments and, and steadily you know, improving your situation in a kind of sliding scale sort of way, you're just going to be uh, moaning and groaning about it. I've spent long enough of my life doing it, and I still have my periods where I do that. And it's a waste of time. You know, what if you uh, got upset about the way your life is and you just started drinking and escape, you know, using escapism, you know, watching television and drinking and taking, you know, vacations all the time and didn't actually face those problems and just let them bleed, let them fester. They're still going to be there, no matter how much television you watch, no matter how many beers you drink, no matter how many trips you take, no matter how much shit you do to avoid having to deal with it, it's still going to be there. And actually, it's far cheaper to fix it now, like now. That's what the Zen Buddhists often talk about, is if something is going to be done, it needs to be done now. And I know that's not always something that is applicable. I think there's a deeper kind of understanding you can have about it if you really sit down and consider it, is that so often we will have a problem in our life or have something that needs to be done and we just put it off it's always in the future but it it's always now you know it's always the present moment and if we resolve to do things now then we're not going to have this overhang of crap that just never gets dealt with you know, if we just deal with it as soon as possible, like not just saying someday I'll deal with this problem, someday I'll do this, but if we break it up and deal with it in a manageable sense, starting now, then even huge problems that maybe you thought could only be done years from now can be done now. Like let's say you wanted to accomplish something big generally speaking people are going to say well that's out in the future that it's not going to happen well maybe you could start taking that thing that you want to accomplish and accomplishing the pieces the prerequisite pieces that have to be accomplished for it to happen now for it to at least start happening now let's say you want to get along with your spouse you want to fix your family you want to have a better relationship with your children. Why not start now? You may not do a perfect job of it. You could start now and you could start doing what you can, learning more about what you can do, and reflecting on what you have done on a regular basis. And that way you're as compassionate as you can be in the moment to those you care about. They're worth it, wouldn't you say? You supposedly love them, right? Many people say that about their family. They love them. 
They often don't have time to deal with them. They don't have the energy, the time. They don't have the balls. Well, why not start having the balls now? Have the balls to deal with reality right now. Take it a piece at a time. It's the only way anything great is accomplished. It's not something that just happens like that in most cases. It's something that happens because of a sustained intent and an awareness, an awareness of reality and a sustained, properly directed intent, well-allocated resources. It's a self-refinement process. It's a self-cultivation that has to occur. You've got to cultivate yourself to be more aware of the reality and to live in the present if you want to have a good future, if you want to have a good present, especially. If you can make the present a wonderful, a wonderful time and a wonderful experience, then the future is bound to be as well. Anyways, that's, uh, that's about all I got for today. I hope to talk to you again next week.